<laughs> oh, guys, hello and welcome to Canine TV. I did say that uh, tonight's episode was going to be a good fun one, so Marie and I are in the middle of a giggle fit, so my apologies. Um, for those of you that haven't tuned in before, my name's Kat. This is my gorgeous friend, Ree. Hi. And tonight we're talking about feel-good dogs and also assistance dogs, so I thought I might start off and... Uh, Introduce Ree, you're an awesome friend of mine, and uh, let you kind of um, you know tell everybody here on the land of Canine TV how we kind of met and that type of thing. Okay, so I first met um, Kat when I was having a few issues with my German Whitehead pointer. Um, I saw a large purple vehicle driving down the road, <laughs> and I went, "I need them," <laughs> and uh, rang the number. And Kat came over and gave me some one-on-one -on -one as I gently handed her the tissues from crying for a few months. Um, and then our friendship and um, her guidance and Brent's guidance developed from there, and we've just been friends ever since. And it was really cool, actually. Um, Ree and I were talking the just the other day. Ree's only just come back from the US, so we're in Melbourne at the moment. And what have you been here? Just over a week now. Just, a week. Just a week now. A week, yeah, a week. So, yeah. Um, and Ree pointed out just the other day that we've known each other for about 10 years or so. 10 years now. Which is yeah, really, really quick. freaking cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we thought we'd do a little bit of a um, collab tonight uh, for a number of reasons. Um, we're super excited to have Ree back in Melbourne. And I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, Ree, Ree certainly um, has a background in, well, what's your background work-wise? Um, so I did 15 years in the Australian Army and then I discharged and became a social worker and my background is working with veterans um, in relation to um, trauma and their families and children as well. So mm -hmm. that's my main background at the moment. Oh, and when I was overseas in the US, I worked for two years with a assistance dog Absolutely. program called Hero Dogs. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, thumbs up if anyone from uh, Hero Dogs ends up uh, tuning in. It'd be awesome. No doubt it's the middle of the night. Then possibly They're asleep. Now. They're asleep, yeah. Yeah. Oh well, that's okay. Um, but yeah, so we thought we'd have a little bit of a chat because, as Ree said, she's uh, had a little bit of experience with Hero Dogs over in the US. Um, and one of the areas that I'm particularly passionate about is uh, the relationship that we can have with our dogs and, and the yeah. benefits that uh, you know it certainly creates. So um, you know, that's the feel good dogs, or also the therapy dogs, as I, I you know loosely kind of describe them. So. You know, let's just talk about the very basics of a feel-good dog. I mean, you know, I'm assuming if you're watching this that you like uh, like dogs, and you come home, and how nice is it? You know, your dogs, you know, yeah, wagging their their tail, and they're yeah. happy to see you, and and all of those type of things. I can see. You. Hi, Dom. Thanks for tuning in, buddy. Um, so, you know, the reason I call them feel-good dogs is because you know that that's exactly what they're they're spot on yeah. at doing, aren't they? And I think generally that's why people get a pet. You yeah. know, no matter what's it's it's that. It's that gap. They want something. They want to feel good about it, and it has nothing to do with work. And it, yeah, it's a time where they can absolutely just... unwind, and there's no judgment, and yeah, it's just totally chilled exactly. out. So, um, some of the um, areas where you can have um, a therapy-related dog, or you know, just a dog, just you know, to generally come in and, and list the feel. I can see those thumbs up, guys. Thank you so much. Um, you know, like uh, we're currently in uh, in designing a school program. We've got some schools uh, interested. Uh, for 2017, which is very exciting, bringing you know dogs into the school program and helping alleviate uh, stress. So whether that be around exam time or even um, having children if they're a little bit uh, you know stressed in mm. regards to reading yep. and those types of things. There's yep. been some fantastic um, programs rolled out. So um, as I said, with reading, communication, and stress reduction, guys, I can see you joining in. Thank you very much. Hi, Kylie. Hi, Wendy. Thanks for joining in. Um, one of the other programs that uh, that we run at the canine company is bringing dogs into the corporate kind of space. So helping with communication skills, um, you know, the de-stress and yeah. and just basically facilitating a much more calmer environment as well. So you know, you can you can utilize that with staff days or you know um, team bonding and those types Definitely. of things. And of course, you've got your therapy dogs as well, and they do such an important role um, visiting nursing homes, uh, retirement villages, or hospitals, and things like that. We've got a number of dogs that train with us at the canine company that do um, an awesome dog. <laughs> Dumb, I've just seen you, so Randy. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, we have awesome dogs come down that train with us and, and do, you know, a super duper job. Just, I know playing a really important role in society and I think Definitely. it's such a non-confrontational yeah. way to to join in in, Definitely. in, in that time. And so Kat mentioned one of the things with dogs going into schools and um, children actually reading to the dogs and they've actually statistically found that 
um, children that struggle mm. with reading are relaxed because there's no judgment from the dog. They lay quietly and the child can actually just read and it doesn't care that it fumbles its words and that children are actually learning to read is yeah. so much better. Well, in there's no situation. judgment, is there? Which no, is none just, whatsoever. It's really, so really cool. It's so, really good. Yeah, so that's why I like to call them feel good because at the they end do. of the day, they, they make us all feel good. And, they do. Um, they do have a, a role in the therapy, which is, you know, they kind of help facilitate um, the environment in which they're in, so to speak. Definitely. So, you know, schools, corporate, uh, the corporate industry, nursing home, retirement villages, etc. You know, they play a very awesome role. Huge now, um, Re, you've had had some experience uh, with assistance dogs, which is slightly different. But uh, yep. what 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 exactly is it in an assistance role? So I've talked about you know your feel good dogs, your therapy dogs. Yeah. You know how they can come into your schools and things like that. Definitely. What what's a role of, of an assistance dog? So an assistance dog is um, highly trained. It takes about two years to train them, mm -hmm. um, and they generally have a role in the sense of mitigating a disability. So um, such as. Well, guide dogs and, and hearing dogs fall into a different category, but they might be a medical alert dog, they might be a psychiatric alert dog, they might be a mobility do uh, uh, dog that helps with those that have mobility issues. So they need to actually have three tasks that specifically mitigate that disability. Um, and they also need to ensure that they have a high quality of public access as well. So, so what would that look like when you're saying that they've got to, you know, provide three tasks? Can you give an yep. example of what that might look like? Because some of these, you know, our awesome viewers may not understand. No, that's cool. So if you look at a mobility dog, someone who actually physically can't bend down and pick up things or open a door or actually um, has struggles to get out of a chair. So they'll be taught to open drawers, open fridges, pick things up off the floor and bring them to them. And also a brace position where the dog is used as a balance to actually help someone up or why they're going up and down stairs. So that's a number of different tasks there Absolutely. that dogs are taught. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't actually make them an assistance dog. They need to have that public access training as well, which is really significant. Mm. Yeah, that's a question with the PTSD. Hey, Leash, how you doing? Uh, what's the difference between assistance dog for someone with PTSD and a, and a therapy dog? Uh, that's a great question. We're going to get back to that one. Just in one second, just bear with me as I go through here and see what's come up here as well. As Ree's busy scribbling that question down. Hey, Deck, thanks for joining in, buddy. Um, and I think, you know, so a lot of people are generally aware of a, of a guide dog. You know, yeah, or a definitely. seeing eye yep, dog. Yep. Um, guys, they are not a blind dog. Okay, so let's <laughs> let's clarify that one first up. Um, the dogs do not have a, a visual disadvantage or disability whatsoever. They they have perfect. Uh, I don't know if you call it 2020 vision. Yeah. But uh, they certainly can see. So just to get that kind of uh, articulation correct, they are a guide dog or a seeing eye dog. There's a thumbs up there. Um, so I think a lot of people um, from the public perception certainly go. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a visual aid. Yep. Um, what would be an example of perhaps a medical alert dog? Okay, so my son has epilepsy and he actually has a seizure alert dog. So she's physically trained to alert to his seizures. And initially she was mm. trained through his facial and spatial positions of his face, and then it was we then moved on to her through scent because he does change his smell when um, he has a seizure. Um, so her three main tasks are to alert. Obviously, she stays with Sam. She will actually come and seek us out and seek some assistance. And she also stops him going into different areas if he's a little bit incoherent and can't work it out. So they're those three sort of tasks yeah. um, in relation to a seizure alert dog. I suppose if we could, do we want to answer Alicia's question? Uh, we will, but if I can just ask okay, one sorry. little question, because yep. I know we've got some awesome people that are on, on um, you know, Canine TV. Yep. Um, there are many, well, it's not a question, I should say, there are many people that uh, supported our Canine Conversations, um, yeah, and, and many people, you know, may slowly start joining the dots now. So, so Chloe um, is that dog. Yeah, so Chloe is uh, Rihanna's son's uh, medical alert dog. So thank you for everyone that uh, helped raise funds for that, because, um, you know, they uh, to, to train a dog, as Rhi was saying, it takes up to two years, and and, um, you know, they're, they're not, uh, you know, the cheapest things in the world. They're very no, they're much worth cheap. it, but uh, yeah. a lot of hard effort and, and work goes into it. So um, let's go into Alicia's question here. So what is the difference between an assistance dog for someone with, for example, PTSD versus yeah. a therapy dog? Okay, so Alicia, with that, a therapy dog doesn't necessarily have any assistance dog training. They actually don't have any physical public access training. 
if your train has your dog has really good obedience and is cleared through people here who do that sort of activity um, therapy dogs then um, your dog could go and be assessed and then be cleared to do that role as a therapy dog so you know there's some amazing dogs in the world that do therapy dogs that don't have any specific training other than being really good pets mm. and having really great obedience they do such a great you they know, do great yep. effort though. so and an assistance dog um in regard to ptsd is quite complex because it depends on the type of ptsd and the triggers and cues and how it presents, and how yeah. it presents. but basically those dogs are actually trained to pick up on anxiety levels and then they will alert to that person by coming and touching them with their nose or resting their head heavily and all it does is it breaks that concentration and enables the person to then focus on mm. the dog they're also trained to turn on a light and then go and get someone if someone's actually physically having a dream they'll actually turn on a radio to break that dream um, message the um, organization that I worked with with in the service dog organization in America they yeah. didn't actually have the dogs physically come up and wake the person because some um, veterans that specifically be can be violent when they come up yeah, and they, that would devastate the relationship mm. so there's blocking exercises as well where the dog can stand between someone and someone else um, but that's not a protective training it's a blocking which is very different so just kind of create a little bit of a spatial spatial awareness yeah, so yeah. opposed to being inside someone's personal space Definitely. bubble it's just, hey he's up yeah. a little bit yeah, yeah. So they're just some of the things. Um, I'm very passionate about veterans and PTSD or PTSD in general, so I could talk about it for hours and we don't have that sort of time. But I hope, Alicia, that answers your question in relation to the difference between therapy and, say, training a dog for PTSD. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Just having a read through here. Uh, Catherine, thanks for joining in. Wow, that's amazing how impressive these dogs are. I wish my dog could be trained for this. Um, and, oh, you've got epilepsy, you know. And I think that's one of the... We all love our dogs and that's definitely they're just an amazing yeah. amazing thing and particularly when it comes to therapy or assistance dogs we're just starting to scratch the surface uh, yeah very you know, it's much the tip so. of the iceberg isn't yeah. it so and i think the reality is as much as your dog may be wonderful for you in that situation at home they may not mm. in the bigger world be able to yeah. um, cope with i think it. one of the analogies i use for that really is it's like public speaking you know there are some people that sit there and they, they hear really you know good, yeah. you've got to do public speaking and yeah. and you know I've, I've been doing it now for quite some time and I don't you know necessarily choke up or you know no, definitely get those you know you know massive jitters or whatnot whereas other people the sheer thought of speaking in front of five definitely. or ten people is, is yeah. you know quite overwhelming and and that can be for just pet dogs in general let alone having to perform a yeah. service um, that you know unfortunately it sometimes can be quite yeah. difficult for them so and, and that's why awesome. it takes them so long to train you know two years is enough time well they believe enough time to to see those things that are happening mm. and it's full, it. full training isn't it, it? Is it's not just training. you know kind of you know once a week kind of it's, no, it's, it's an immersion seven. immersion Very experience much. so yeah and the dogs still can fail once paired as well because it only takes one thing unfortunately yeah, absolutely. To yeah. um hey bella freebarn thank you for joining i helped super supervise sony star camp on the weekend and it was amazing to see a golden retriever called hank act as he was an aide with a gorgeous little girl so lovely to see uh, the beautiful and amazing relationship bear with me yeah oh, that's it. yeah absolutely you know I think again I mean who doesn't love their dogs guys give us you know th throw up some love hearts there as they say because it doesn't matter you know for those of you that are regular tuners in you know I love Zuka but you know I don't need him as a therapy dog and and you know I'm blessed not to have have the requirements of, of an assistance dog but yeah. they are just amazing uh, so Alicia's just got back to us. Wow, that's actually way more complex than what I thought it would have. Yeah, yeah than it what is it would complex. have been. Yeah. Kylie, thanks for joining in, chick. Awesome. I'm sure we'd all love to listen for hours. Such a great program. Thank you Thank so you. much for joining in. Um, ah, Braddles, hello. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> and welcome home to, to Rihanna. So, Thank you. Um, guys, if you have any questions, please just uh, pop them in the comment uh, box down below. Um, we did get a couple of questions yeah. come through from Lyndall. So hopefully you're uh, you're tuned in and joined in with us, Lyndall. So if you just want to read out uh, some of the questions yeah, that, that cool. Lyndall um, had, and I think this one's actually a really interesting one, the first one. It's to do with, obviously, um, Reed just coming back from the States with her family yeah. um, and what it's like having a service dog. So 
So um, Lyndall asked about toileting on a long haul flight. So with a service dog, Chloe was actually um, allowed to travel in the cabin with my son. So um, there is a, it's a long flight, it's 15 hours, but obviously there was a number of flights in between that. So Lyndall's question was in relation to um, toileting and how she coped with that flight. So Chloe's food was cut off 24 hours prior to the flight and water 12 hours. So controlled, controlled like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So a bit the, like what we have to do for going on a, a long <laughs> trip. <laughs> it gets worse as you get older. <laughs> Um, but one of the things is, is that obviously if we were flying straight up, it would have been 24 hours without water yeah. as well. But because we had a couple of other flights in the situation we were in, we were able to just reduce the water 12 hours out. But she gets icebox every couple of hours, so yeah. she doesn't dehydrate and yeah. that her mouth is like wet. Maybe, maybe a good example, like if we're in a hospital and we need to exactly. keep afterwards. afterwards yeah, and you can't eat course. anything, you can have some. Yeah. The we, wonderful thing about the US, I have to say, is that all the airports have pet relief centres oh, awesome. inside the terminal. So yeah. we were um, able to do that. And yeah. Chloe only toilets on command, so... We were yeah. really, really lucky. Can I so. ask in regards yeah. to that? Um, you know, there might may not be people that have, have travelled internationally. Yeah. So if we're talking cabin, you know, what do we call it? Cattle class? Yeah. So where does Chloe fit? Like if you're sitting in a, in a standard flight, yeah. cattle class, you know, for I'm five foot ten, so you haven't got the world's longest legs, but they're, they're all right. Well, Sam's six foot three. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the wonderful where things... Where does Chloe sit? Yeah. So one of the wonderful things about travelling is with an assistance dog, especially is with Qantas, is they actually give you a seat free and you don't have to pay for it. So if there's a three across, there'll be um, Sam and Chloe and, and or he can be on the corner yep. in the aisle or near yeah, the window yeah. and then there's a spare seat so that's a really so is chloe allowed on the seat no, she's, no. so no sitting on the seat yeah. and she's just trained to lay on the floor okay. or curl up at and just seat. out of the i'm assuming this may come up in a question um when you have an assistance dog so obviously uh in this case chloe has all the correct paperwork certification etc yep. is she allowed to be in for example an exit row because we all love an exit no. row there's extra leg room yeah yeah, yeah. So the best, she's not allowed in an exit row because obviously um, if there's an emergency, yeah. she can't open the Absolutely. exit door. So that's one of the issues. I reckon she's pretty clever. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't mind necessarily putting money on her saving me. That would so be obviously fun. that's why she doesn't sit in an exit row. Yeah. Um, the best position for a person with a service dog is actually the bulkhead because there's nothing in front. It's yeah. firm and there's actually heaps of room there. Yeah, so. cool. But we were lucky enough to travel business class and there's heaps of room. Well, hello. <laughs> and it's the only time that I'll travel business class, so I loved every minute. All right. So, so yeah, second if we get down. back into, oh, we've done all the toileting and the yeah. water with the ice cubes, etc. Yes. Um, the other question that um, Linda asked was about the retiring age of a service mm -hmm. dog. So every program is very is different, and every dog is different. So, but on average, it works about seven to eight years. So if the dog is trained. Um, up until about two and maybe not being actually given to the person or partner till they're three. Yeah. You're looking at about a seven to eight year working yeah. life of the dog. The dog generally stays with the family yeah. uh, of the retire of the person they've been working with. And what's happened is that, and every program is different, but our other program I worked with within the US, a new puppy is, uh, or dog is introduced to that dog so yeah. that there's no conflicts like anything. Um, dogs don't get on, um, so you have to make sure that there's well, going to be a fit, doesn't it? Exactly. Absolutely. So, um, but generally speaking, most of the people stay. Yeah. You know, and we dogs see that. Like that. We see that also with um, you know a lot of our police dogs as well. Again, Definitely. a completely different yeah, role, but yeah. you know they get to retire and stay home, and you know, yeah. hopefully live out their retirement being sport Definitely. bloody rotten for their service. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I've not heard of anyone not. Um, keeping their service dog on retirement. Mm. I'm sure that it does happen sometimes, but generally a family member or a really close friend will pick up the yeah. dog who knows its requirements and stuff. Yeah, so they cool. were really great questions from Linda. Yeah. Wherever you are. <laughs> Guys, look, thank you so much for joining in. If you have any questions in, in regards to, um, you know, bringing dogs into schools or into the your corporate workspace uh, for stress relief or just, you know, uh, team bonding or that type of thing or um, anything in relation to PTSD, whatnot, uh, just reach out, let us know. Thank you so much for joining in. Ray, thank love you. having you home. It's awesome to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye.